Good evening, uh, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. Uh, I'm Hania Salah, director of, the <clears throat> director of the Columbia Global Center in Amman. We're delighted to have with us this evening Dr. Johanna Mendelssohn Foreman, a foreign policy, conflict, and reconstruction expert and rising gastro diplomat. Johanna Mendelssohn Foreman is an adjunct professor at American Universi University School of International Service in Washington, D.C., and a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center, where she heads the food security program. Johanna's frontline experience as a policymaker on conflict and stabilization efforts drove her interest in connecting the role of food in conflict, resulting in the creation of an interdisciplinary course she teaches called Conflict Cuisine, an introduction to war and peace around the dinner table. With this groundbreaking curriculum, Johanna challenges her students to explore new ways of looking at diplomacy, conflict re resolution, and civic engagement, and how food as a form of smart power can drive these issues in the 21st century. In her own words, after decades of trying to solve some of the world's most intractable conflicts, I've come to believe that bringing people together around a common table may be a better way to build peace than other forms of intervention. In fact, I believe the kitchen is the new venue of foreign policy. Johanna is an expert on post-conflict transition and democratization issues. She served as a senior advisor for humanitarian response at the US Agency for International Development, where she helped establish the Office of Transition Initiatives. Johanna's previous position includes serving as a director of peace security and human rights at the United Nations Foundation, senior advisor at the United Nations Mission in Haiti, and senior associate with the World, World Bank's post-conflict unit. Johanna is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She holds a JD from Washington College of Law at American University, a PhD in Latin American History from Washington University, St. Louis, and a Master of International Affairs from Columbia University. In closing, I would like to recognize the US Embassy in Amman for their partnership on this event. Now I turn it over to our distinguished speaker to address food security, what are the links between global hunger and instability, and the preventive measures that can be taken. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Johanna Mendelssohn Foreman. Just move it down. It's what happens when you're short. Well, I'm going to stand here so you can see me a little bit. Um, first of all, thank you so much for that warm introduction. I feel at home here. Uh, I'm a part of Columbia University. It's close to my heart. Uh, I went there when it was still called the School of International Affairs. It's before they became the School of Public Policy. That tells you a little bit about how old I am. But it formed the basis of my own interest and launched my career in international affairs. So it is an honor to be here in one of its satellite centers, and I'm very happy to see such a wonderful crowd here tonight of friends, of people from the United States Embassy, of all the wonderful support team that I've had, and to my co-envoy, who I'm here with, Angela Gervas, who joined me in this trip to Jordan. Um, there are too many people to thank, but we'll talk after the uh, speech. So today, I'm, I was asked to talk about food security, and obviously, it's an issue. All you have to do is turn on any news broadcast, and you'll hear about it. And the issue that affects us all is that food security and climate change are two sides of the same coin. Climate change is the largest threat we face. As our planet grows hotter, we face a world where we have a harder time ensuring that there will be enough food to eat now and into the future. As a global community, the discussions which begin this week in Sharm El Sheikh at COP27 are going to feature food security and climate. They'll be central as we talk about commitments to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. You all know that climate change has led to a 1.2 degrees Celsius warming. But what is different now is that there has been a global political awakening 
that it hopefully will move us forward to the transformations that we need and to the agriculture that will adapt so there'll be enough food to, for our planet in 2050. I think it's easier because I have to use the slides. So, can you hear me? Okay. You just can't see me, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, there was a U.S. Congresswoman named Barbara Mikulski, who was shorter than I was. And I once, when I, in my early youth, worked with her, and she never talked unless she had a little box to stand, to stand on. And she'd get very angry at her staff if they didn't. So that's what happens when you get short. But that's my life story. I got short. But to be serious, let us look at the world we live in today. There's a billion people, at a minimum, that are malnourished or suffer the pains of hunger. And while we, the world wastes about a third of all the food it's, that it's produced, we are living through the first European war of the 21st century, and we are witnessing an invasion of a peaceful country by a neighboring aggressor. A little aside, last year I was in Ukraine last November invited by the U.S. Embassy and their foreign ministry to teach them a course on food security and gastro diplomacy. It's almost ironic to be sitting here and talking about Ukraine when last year there was so much hope among the foreign policy community there that they were working on relieving their own challenges, of which we know are many, and now we are at a war. We are also living in a world that has enough food to feed everybody today. But there are 40 countries in the world that are experiencing extreme hunger, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Southeast Asia and two in Latin America. And I'm a Latin Americanist by training, I admit that. This is a part of the world I'm only getting to know in the last 10 years. We are living through a first global pandemic that has wrought death and disruption to human lives. And even though we have a vaccine to counter COVID-19, we are suffering in different parts of the world because of the inequality of vaccination distribution and because we really don't know what's ahead. There are so many diseases because of climate change and warming, zoonoic diseases, disease carried by animals to human that we have no idea that we will face, but we will face them, but we will face them with lessons learned from COVID. We are seeing the acceleration of climate change as a factor that impacts food security around the world. And we're living through one of the greatest periods of hyperinflation. Global food prices have increased about 13% in the developed country, and many people around the world are unable to afford the basic foods basket. So let's start with what is food security, because I think we have to start from that beginning. The widely accepted definition, which comes out of the World Food Summit in 1996, is that food security, of course, means that you have both the physical and economic access to safe, nutritious food. You can read the definition. And to be food secure is to have physical and economic access that gives you the food. But it's easier said than done. We know that. I just told you the challenges of war, global inflation, supply chains, they don't deliver anymore. And the lack of an economic opportunity in many countries around the world make food security elusive for more than a billion people. So achieving zero hunger by 2060, 20, 2030, part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, has grown elusive. And at least according to the State of Food Insecurity in 2022, that's the publication that put, put out by the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, we are not going to meet those goals. Now, let me see. So we have three C's. David Beasley was very good about giving them a, a title. The director of the World Food Program this summer, when he came to the UN, said he is witnessing a hurricane of hunger around the world. And in 2022, what happens this year will have a lasting impact across the globe. Now, these three Cs, climate, conflict, and COVID, I've mentioned. But the storm is getting greater because we also have a fourth C, and that's cost. Every person around the world, whether you're living in a developed country, a developing country, or an impoverished conflict country, is not able to access the same amount of food. Fortunately, some countries subsidize food, but in fact, our basic assumptions about globe, global food supplies are being reassessed. 
So first, let me start with the operating assumption that uh, uh, the world is going to have enough food by to feed 9 billion people by 2050. Climate scientists are now revising that data. And what they do feel is while the world will produce food, it will only be 50% more than what we need. And the new data suggests that this trend will actually continue to create problems. For example, in areas of Africa, agricultural production may actually drop by 10% rather than rise by 50%. And what will this mean to hung a hunger-free future? We really don't know. Second, we must lo not lose perspective. And I don't want to be a downer in this talk. The world has seen great progress in alleviating hunger. I think everybody in this room who's ever studied international relations know that since 1945, at the end of the Second World War until today, there has been remarkable achievement in economic growth. Millions and millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. That doesn't mean our job is done, but we are certainly further along. We have seen the progress in countries like Brazil and India and China, and those countries have been able to reduce poverty and give access to food through the generosity of science, through the generosity of bilateral, through new relations. Agricultural development programs and social protection programs have really made a difference. And these are great accomplishments. So let's keep them in our mind. But the sustainable development goals are very important in terms of a global commitment. We'll hear all about them again in the next few weeks at COP. And there's 17 goals. You know all about them. But the commitment included ending world hunger. And climate change and conflicts have, been, have not spared various parts of the world. Even before the pandemic, areas of sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia experienced severe drought. In fact, we're in this 40-year drought cycle now. Both the United Nations and the uh, UN Food and Agricultural Organization have said again, as I mentioned, that we cannot feed the hungry that we have. And just to give you some numbers, I'm just going to move the slide. I'm going to put nice sustainable goals up there. In the, it's the first time in decades since, 2015, since 2016 that 815 million people were undernourished, an increase of 38 million from 2015. That's a lot. And almost 500 million of the world's hungry live in countries affected by conflict, which is what I want to talk a little bit about tonight. And with the war in Ukraine, it is estimated that another 135 million people are now seriously food insecure. And the number is almost 50 million who face famine today. So these are not happy numbers to think about, and we really need to address them. I also wanted to just point out that there's a wonderful UNICEF World Food Program in Jordan that has been working with youth-led efforts on food security, and I was happy enough to find this nice slide, and I wanted to include the efforts that are going on in this country because people are certainly facing, what, looking at what we face. So these are more of the statistics that you see. I will have these slides available, by the way, if anybody wants them after. So let's talk a little bit about life in the Anthropocene. And I'll go back to these maps. In 2020, which is two years ago now, the United Nations Development Program noted that we are living in the age of the Anthropocene. What is that? It's where humans are creating the gravest threats to our planet. We must find a way to mitigate them. And these are what I think are what the uh, UN report highlighted. So for 12,000 years, we were living in the Holocene. We are now in a man-made climate era, which is creating great threats to the way we live. If the current trends continue, the number of people affected by hunger will surpass 840 million by 2030, which is 9.8% of the global population. Just think about that. That's a lot of people who will be facing hunger. And the figure did not even consider the impact of the pandemic. Almost 40% of the world's population, 3.5 billion, cannot afford a healthy diet. And producing food uh, must not only be nutritious, but it has to be affordable. So I just wanted to show you this picture of what one meal a day looked like. Uh, this is from Chad. It was done in a study. And these are real photographs that were done by a uh, Lisa Palmer is a uh, 
journalist who covers climate and hunger, and I just thought these were really illustrative of what one meal a day looked like. Of the 195 countries in the world, at least 34, five in Asia and 29 in Africa, are unable to produce their own food due to water or land limitations. These countries are also conflict-afflicted states. And that gets me to one of my more favorite topics, which is food and conflict. There are so many areas you could talk about with food, but because I came out of this whole period when we thought we could rebuild nations and end conflicts quickly, I've always thought that conflict is truly an area which is the greatest disruptor. And this slide is very illustrative of how hunger and instability are a, cy a cycle. You can take a look at understanding the link. It comes from a report that was done by the World Food Program USA called Winning the Peace. And it's fascinating that since the end of the Cold War, we have seen that man-made conflicts continue to plague so many countries. Most of these are places you know, headlines like Syria, Yemen, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Haiti. Many are frozen conflicts, a term that us wonky social scientists like to use, but what it results in is starvation that comes from fighting. The World Bank, along with the UN Department of Political Affairs, compiles these lists annually, and they rarely change. I give my students an assignment every year to pull up the list and pick the countries that are climate affected or war affected, and it's always interesting to me to see how little variation is on that list. Out of a group of 33 countries, and I'll get back to this in a minute, let me see if I have the list. These are the 10 worst countries in 2019 by crisis, and I think the list is here. Let's go to that one and I'll go back. Of these countries, 33 countries are responsible for the largest number of food insecure people. I want to emphasize this, 33 countries are, the responsibility, are responsible for where most hunger comes from. Now you would think, I said I came to solve the world's greatest problems, I'm one woman, I can't do it alone, I need every one of you in the room, but the fact is, that's a tragedy that we have so many hungry people in so few countries. And those countries in conflict were home to 60% of the world's hungriest people. That's 489 million people. And let's not forget children, because they pay a horrible price. An estimated 122 million of the 155 million stunted children in the world come from conflict-affected countries. And moreover, conflict countries are places where fighting never stops, where they require continuous need for humanitarian assistance. So we know there are ongoing civil wars, they're waged by regular fighters, irregular fighters, and they continue to wreak havoc on civilians. Now, conflict states affect food supplies, and I'm gonna go back. Let me just, no, let me go, no, that's, I gotta go back, back. Okay, conflict does affect food supplies because I like this picture that Mercy Corps did, this chart, because it shows what happens in a normal pan planting season, which is up at the top, you can see that, and then what happens when a war takes place. You can't plant when a war is going on because you can't put seeds in, you're fleeing, you can't harvest, and the end result is there's no food in the winter. And that's what we're facing right now. War disrupts planting cycles. People flee, farmers cannot plant, and the rest of the story is in this picture. Food insecurity and political instability go hand in hand. I showed you the feedback loop. There are multiple drivers of this instability. But the bottom line is no harvest, no food for your family. And this continues as we speak. Today in Ethiopia, for example, the Tigray province has become one of the most food deprived areas in the world. There is actually a starvation alert there. One, in three, one to three million people have uh, been starving since November 2020 to February 2021. And I know there's negotiation that's just started between the Tigrayan province and the government of Ethiopia, but it underscores the fragility of life in many of these regions, all because this human tragedy is affected by food. And the list, which sadly I think I showed you, does not change much over time. It is true that 80% of the countries that are food insecure remain on this World Bank list that I showed you. 
By 2030, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization projects that two-thirds of the world's poor are expected to live in these conflict fragile states. Now, the United Nations has done some things that are very important regarding this, and I'm gonna advance ahead to food as a weapon of war and then go to the UN Security Council Resolution 2417. So I'm sure you know food is a weapon of war. And I wanted to flag this problem because we tend to overlook it. It's the oldest weapon of war. It's the cheapest weapon of war. And the problem continues to plague countries where there are authoritarian governments who use food as a weapon. As I said, it's not a new tactic, but armed conflicts, blockades that restrict humanitarian access, dictators and rebels alike who turn to food as a weapon is becoming more and more popular. If I'm not mistaken, this is a picture from Venezuela where there was a uh, terrible use of food as a, a way to get populations to you know, conform with the government there, but in fact, it hasn't been successful. Fortunately, the situation is getting a little better in Venezuela, but in fact, uh, it's still pretty grave. The other picture here is from the Ukraine, recent pictures of the war. Uh, the picture shows on the top the fields that have been bombed by Russian artillery, and the bottom, of course, is a farm which has also been destroyed. And of course, as you know, Ukraine is the bread basket, one of the bread baskets of the world, and you don't recover very quickly. Syria is another example, a nearby country, which has until recently been starving its population. I know during the height of the war in Syria, basic food supplies, flour, oil, rice, were ways to force compliance. And one of the favorite tactics of the government in Syria was to bomb people on bakery lines. There are many, many uh, stories, but beyond stories, documents uh, that Human Rights Watch put together in the Red International Committee for the Red Cross that showed people standing on line for bread, which of course is so important in this part of the world, actually being bombed as they were waiting. Now, this situation has grave legal consequences. We know that harming civilians comes under the Geneva Convention as a crime of war, but nevertheless, we'd never see any kind of action on an international level that really goes after perpetrators of such horrific crimes. Another horrible place, let me see. Oh, we're gonna make peace with nature soon, but uh, is Yemen. And I wanna talk about Yemen because it's the worst man-made starvation situation we see today. It's not a shortage of food in the case of Yemen. There's no access to food because of rebels holding up food supplies, food going from the ports into the cities. And it's another really poster child example of what happens when people can't work during a wartime and nobody has money to buy food. And a person who's a Middle East expert in my community came over to me and said, why, I didn't know that the issue in Yemen wasn't a lack of food, it was that people couldn't buy it. And in fact, that's really the case. Another danger spot is the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is throughout my career has been poised to overtake Yemen as a terrible place because 20 million people are facing food crisis. And of course today, Afghanistan is yet another country with 17 million new in food insecure people. Nigeria, 1.13 million. Uh, it just continues. And the World Food Program said this year at the United Nations General Assembly that they are going to need $8.5 billion in commitments to meet all these humanitarian needs. That is a huge amount of money. So I, I go to one last thing. I'm going to go back in my slides. I think I have this. I'm advancing, sorry. To the UN Security Council 2417. How many of you have known about this resolution? Because this is really one of the important steps that took place. In, it mandated the Security Council to be informed of the risk of conflict-induced widespread food insecurity. The member states of the UN had already recognized how important the link between food and insecurity was, but by invoking this resolution as food insecurity coupled with the pandemic and the devastating uh, starvation that resulted, there was much more activity and it was invoked for two reasons very recently. 
One during COVID, the Secretary General used this resolution to demand a ceasefire in the countries that were having armed conflict and pretty much was able to get some of this done. And more recently, it became the basis of the United Nations and the international community's action to free the port of Odessa so that grain that was already in storage from last year could get out. And of course, we know that's a very precarious type of agreement because it's being used as one way, another weapon of war, where Russia is trying to once again prevent food as a bargaining chip for getting other concessions. But I did want to point this out because it does represent, in my view, some positive piece of uh, progress at the Security Council where often we don't hear many good news stories coming out of it. So let me, I don't know which direction I'm gonna go. Let me go back. All right. I wanted to make peace with nature, so let's go back there. Uh, I think one of the most interesting comments I ever heard was in 2018. The Swedish diplomat, Jan Eliasson, who was the former Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and also a, I think he heads the think tank now, um, C um, CIPRI, or he's on the board, said that if we want to work with food, we have to make peace with nature. Because 80% of the people we must uh, uh, say we must protect the planet, and 40% say they will take concrete actions to save it. Unfortunately, 40% is not enough. And why people are meeting as we speak at Sharm el Sheikh is precisely because we need to do something beyond that. But environmental justice is essential, but, it is also, but so is food as a basic right. So we must consider reducing hunger as part of a larger system which addresses the way we use energy, reduce greenhouse gases, emissions, and organize our agricultural systems. And we must be prepared to accept that changes in agriculture that cause climate are real. I do think that finally is beginning to sink in to many of the anal analyses that we see. Yields of crops are definitely going to decline as the planet heats up. The 20, by 2050, severe drought in the northern hemisphere is expected to last three months a year. In areas where there's high heat, the duration of this heat will last longer. This is a place like the Middle East. Can you imagine farming at night when you can't work during the day? Can you imagine having light to farm at night? But these are realities. There are technical advance, technological advances in farming and they're already in play. In the developed world, we have lots of new equipment that measures water content, new seed yieldings, but these advances are not available to everyone. The small woman farmer in sub-Saharan Africa cannot be guaranteed that she's going to have someone to measure that water or have fertilizer for her crops. And so in this context, climate will yield many areas that have many, there will be many parts that are more verdant because of monsoons in sub-Saharan Africa, but there's no guarantee of what will happen. And these changes that will take resources will also take good governance. Going to go forward. Am I going back? I'm going back. Sorry. So, ending hunger is possible, but we must work together. And at a local level, recognizing that these issues will be expensive will require communities of nations and local communities of citizens to all work toward a more secure food world. So, I wanted to show you this food waste, which to me is one of the problems that I think would be easier to resolve is so dramatic because I learned something at Columbia, I will say. I had uh, Barbara Ward is my professor. That tells you again how old I am. And she told me in the first day of class of international economics, she said, there is no garbage in the third world. Uh, but there is garbage in the third world. Barbara Jackson, uh, Lady Jackson, was uh, Barbara Ward was wrong. The food waste is one of the biggest sources of CO2 emissions. Do you know that if, food wa if landfill were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of CO2 emissions? And that was a project done by um, one of the task force. It's, um, I'll remember the name, the, the uh, 
there's a US task force that's private out in the West that has done these projections, and I was stunned, because if you walk around cities and you see landfills, think of what it's doing to the atmosphere. And you don't even think about burning coal. This is just garbage. So we have to find food uh, solutions to food insecurity that are going to require actions, and actions that we all must take. So we are guardians of this earth, and making peace with nature can take different forms. And whether it's reducing food waste or seeking a sustainable way to grow and distribute food or eating fewer animal products or reducing this waste, the first principle of food security is we must incorporate it in the way we think. And that gets to education. We must begin to work with communities. And I saw some wonderful examples here in Jordan over the last few days of communities who are taking their own action. But this has to be collective and it has to be done at a local, regional, and national scale. And then we also need to think about some other things, sea level rises. This is going to happen. We have seen what is going on. And what happens with sea level rises? In addition to the destruction and people having to move, I haven't even begun to tap the surface of climate migrants. Climate migration is real. It's happened and it's been going on for a long time. Just look at the United States. Uh, the southwest of the United States and the Central America's dry corridor has caused a whole range of people moving northward. Not because it's political so much as it's economic. People cannot grow food on land, and this is something that I think we have to address. There was a suggestion that we're going to need global passports for climate migrants, because as people move out, what are they going to be? They are not refugees under the international law, but they are going to be temporary people who are going to move to different areas, more for safety and security, not because the government is pursuing them. And these are new policy issues we're going to have to think about when we want to think about feeding the, the uh, 9 billion people by 2050. Um, I just put this up on the screen because this picture made a big impact on me. During COVID, and this is the figure I've given you, uh, the number of people who were hungry was uh, one in three people in the world. But I do think this is a picture from the United States. And I always want to believe that you know, people say well, we're perfect, we have the food. During COVID, there was a tremendous problem of getting food to people who no longer had jobs. And while we had a good social safety net, this picture of people lining up at a food bank in May 2020, which was a little bit after the pandemic was declared a global emergency, illustrates the challenges with, that happen when you lose your job and you have no income and no access to food. So just let me review quickly, what are the lessons we've learned? Well, we do know that we have to understand the connections between food and conflict as we go forward. Food activism is something that I haven't talked a lot about here, but I want to mention it because food activism is something that individuals can do. For me, chefs have become the new activists in the world. And why have chefs become activists? Because they understand, they have control of food, they prepare food, they understand food waste. And most important is that they have been organizing globally with principles of good practices in the kitchen and outside the kitchen to prevent food waste. And so it's natural that food security converges with those who cook your food. And food chefs also have been doing an incredible job of educating communities and trying to build social integration through food. Uh, and to me, out of this crisis comes this new opportunity. A few years ago, I met some people at the World Economic Forum who were talking about social gastronomy. And I thought, what is this? But using food for social impact, using food as a tool for change, using food to train people who come from other lands is a very good way to start. And these are opportunities we cannot miss. You know, there's an interesting fact that the first thing you lose with becoming a newcomer to a new land is your language, but you never lose your food tradition and culture. You can also use this to train people, and this is what is happening, and I do feel a very important part of food security. So what do we do? 
If the economic equalities prevent people from access to food, are we going to face ongoing humanitarian crises? Of course we will. Humanitarian crises are not over, but I do believe that there is something we can do to prevent these things. And I'm just putting up these charts because this comes from Feeding America, this is food insecurity. But development policies are moving forward in the right direction. Before we only talked about saving lives in the humanitarian cone, we are now talking about resilience. And resilience means not only doing things that will save lives, but we will be giving people tools, and people will give, be giving themselves the tools to improve their lives. Solutions require a willingness to implement new ways to work with the land. And governance is central. I'm not going to give a speech on the geopolitical consequences of food insecurity, but governance is really important as well. A country that fails to consider the fate of its citizens or fails to respect the rules-based international system will find it harder to address the root causes of hunger, and we see this every day. But what do we do? I'm going to move forward. What can we do to prevent hunger? I loved this picture, and I wanted to mention it because this is in Jordan. It was one of the most hopeful things, and I thank one of our guests here for calling my attention to it, but this is the planting of zikra, which is a wheat product, wheat that was originally from Jordan, is drought resistant, and is now being tried. I think this is, an, I don't know what building it is, it's near City Mall, so it's probably not too far from here. Is it, it's, it's, it's around the corner. But to me, it was one of the community-based solutions that recognize hope, that recognize that you can go to heritage products, that you can go to things that are drought resistant and return to solutions that people probably knew about but forgot on the international trading systems. So I show this picture because I hope some of you will go over and look at it, but I think even more important that people will start thinking about this use of crops that once grew here and were drought resistant and how countries like Jordan, which have water issues, return to the basic kinds of things that they have to grow. Then reform of the global food system, of course, is what is going to be talked about at Sharm El Sheikh. But food is a global public good. It doesn't know borders. We have saw what happened with supply chains. I mean, there are only six large grain exporters around the world. We have to change that dynamic. That doesn't mean we want the Cargills to go out of business. It doesn't mean we want the Bungus to go out of business. But we want people to recognize the importance of local as well as international. And I think the pandemic has pushed people to do more of that, but we need to reform even further. And we have to help cultivate, as I said, orphan crops. In other words, food community takes, a, food security takes a community. And local solutions are going to be the best way to create a more secure food system. We can achieve peace through food. I think we can achieve peace through the kitchen. But we must be collaborative and we have multiple par partners so that we never reach a situation where starvation and famine become the norm. That is not what we want. We are living in an age where everything is possible. But food is a human right, and we have to start with that present. Because moving beyond humanitarianism is the first step that governments must take if we want to help millions of people. And whether the world can sustain continued inputs of disaster relief, either created by natural war or natural events, remains one of the big questions before us. And it's certainly in the mind of every policymaker. So I think we can mitigate food insecurity and climate change. It's going to take time. It's a long process. But thinking about ways to do it, supporting youth and innovation, and supplying food around the globe, and taking advantage of the modern technologies that will mitigate the damages caused by hotter climates is something that we have to do. We can reform the system. We can make progress. I would not want to think that I live in a world with the resources and the promise that we have and not be able to do that. So I want to thank you. I know I gave you a lot of facts and a lot of numbers, but I would be really happy to stand and take some questions. 
you can challenge me if you want. I work in a classroom and I get challenged every time, but uh, <laughs> lots of times actually. So um, please ask me some questions, throw me some softballs and hardballs, and thank you again. Is that, do you mind if I some people had questions before I started, uh, but I have a question for you. Are you as optimistic as I am that these problems can be solved? Oh, I see a few days No, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, please. There is a will, there is a way. I'm sorry? If there is a will, there is a way. Is there a will, there is a way. I think it's more than a will. I was quite interested. A few weeks ago, I was on a call with the World Food Program. And the young woman working in Central African Republic, which has severe problems of conflict and food insecurity, told one of the most uplifting stories I had heard. And I never expected it to come out of CAR, Central African Republic, where one of my colleagues at Stimson was almost kidnapped working on the conflict. You remember that, Jesse? But what this young woman said was, I'm working with women in the community. And the women have decided they can't count on the international aid and they can't count on the men, but they are going to get together and they are going to figure out within their locality, it was you know, one area of the country, but they were going to figure out what they needed to feed their children, to feed the community, what they had to plant. And I said, that is really good. And the World Food Program was helping them, which I also felt was very encouraging. But it reinforced what I think we're all learning post-COVID, in that it has to start at a local level. You cannot do this alone. And we need the international actors for sure. We need the supplies of the World Food Program. We need the supply of Food for Peace, USAID, all the go different governments of the world that contribute to this. But it has to be the commitment of people. And I think the best takeaway for me that I've had here in the few days I've had in Jordan is watching the commitment of local women who are actually doing exactly what the women in Central African Republic are doing. They're taking matters into their own hands. They're becoming entrepreneurs. That's the role of chefs. They're becoming people who want to make progress. They are not going to take challenges of resources or technologies. They're going to succeed. Now, of course, this has to be built to scale. But for me, witnessing these kinds of grassroots activity rather than standing with my nose in a book and teaching um, is a very useful lesson to bring back to students. Um, we know. Um, and I know there's a gentleman here from SIPE with Private for Entrepreneurship. In countries where there have refugees, the programs that support entrepreneurship have been some of the most positive things that I've seen to help improve food security. No, it's not a golden answer and a solution. No, it's not going to take the pain and suffering of the refugee situation away. But it's certainly food becomes a means that is A, not as controversial or conflictive and allows people to move about their life and solve their conflict. So I, I'm sure that someone wants to challenge me. Someone should. Oh, you have a microphone there, so that's good. There's a lovely person here in a red dress that can challenge me. Um, I wouldn't consider it a challenge by any means. <laughs> I, I was just using that in a rhetorical sense. Forgive yes. me. Um, but you know, I, I hear these lectures about food, conflict, food security. Um, and now it's just kind of have a new term on it, right? We, now we look at global warming, climate change, but food insecurity has been an issue longer than many of us have been alive. It goes back um, before climate change was even a thought. Um, and so my, if you would call it a challenge, is to say that food security and conflict, um, that food security is kind of a stem from conflict is true, but at the same time, there has to be something deeper, another reason why the international actors, right, the powers that be were the powers 
that have been. And so, and it's still a cycle that continues on, but we continue to blame conflict, the global warming. At what point do we say, okay, maybe it's not global warming. Maybe it's just us not doing our jobs, us not doing, you know, as a global community, as a world, you know, as especially as we become more um, interconnected. When do we stop like looking to external reasons why people are starving and start looking inward? Well, I think you, you make a very good observation, and I think some things are very important that you said if I could break it down. And one of the things you said is uh, on climate change, until last year, the international, IP, international program, IPCC, because I can't get all the initials out, finally linked food security with climate. It took all those years, over a decade, to get those connected. So when you don't connect what are obviously very closely linked, it's hard to take something that's intangible that you don't see every day and make someone believe it. But these are disruptors. These are the means. I mean, people obviously have to take action. But if you don't see anything changing very fast, you aren't going to do anything about it. That's why, as my dear friend Jana Lyerson once said, we have to make peace with nature each one of us, and making peace with nature means something different to each person. Whether it's not wasting as much food, whether it's not you know using meat every day or more, using more plant-based food, people can do things at an individual level. That doesn't mean it's gonna make things better because the science is there, and we know our planet is getting hotter, and we know that mitigation of this is very difficult, um, I am a great believer in science. Uh, I think science will come up with some answers to deflect some of this heat. I know there are some great projects going on in geophysics about mirrors that are going to deflect the light. There's something going on, I know, at Columbia, if I'm not mistaken, on these vast er efforts to prevent uh, the heat from rising. But we're living in the reality. So yes, you're right that people don't act because they have to be alarmed. And I think one thing that, just sitting in the United States, obviously I'm here in Jordan, is this most recent hurricane in Florida was a real call to action because it showed the power of nature. This was not a government that did it. It wasn't an, a war. It was the power of a storm that destroyed a city that nobody ever thought could be destroyed. And it made people realize, hey, maybe this is real. And I think, that's a very important thing. So I th you have your rights to be dead. But conflict has always been a disruptor. And I think we, we say conflict, but that's why I put that chart up, because it affects the whole agricultural cycle. If you can't plant, if you're a farmer, small farmer, whether you're in sub-Saharan Africa or whether you're in Central America, and a war is going on and you can't go to your field and you can't plant, then you're not gonna have any food in the fall, and people know that. And you do two things, you either pick yourself up and you move north, or you risk your life, and you become dependent on humanitarian aid. Neither is a good option, but that's what it is. So I, I appreciate your comment, because it makes it's frustrating, but I'm happy that there is now this linkage with food security and climate. Anybody else have a comment? Yes, there are a couple people now. Dr. Johanna, thank you very much. This was an excellent presentation. Thank I you, have, um, I have two questions here. The first question is, since you're emphasizing the role of chefs and how they, what uh, role they can play in diplomacy and in steering the wheel or changing the narrative towards food security, where do you see the role of farmers coming into play? And from what I have witnessed from my experience, at least in the Middle East and North Africa, is that farmers are resorting to practices to, to growing crops that are profitable, but they're not nutritious, they're not climate smart, etc. And so among those crops are uh, drugs. So how can we, where do you see the, the interlinkages between farmers and chefs on this front? And the other question uh, also revolves around the recommendations for also integrating the climate narrative. 
is that we often tell people eat less meat and go more plant-based, but then the people who are really impacted by climate issues are those people who are not even accessing meat. Right. And they're already on a plant-based uh, diet. So again, some, when you talk to them about any climate uh, smart approach, they get offended, they get frustrated because they don't feel that it is their role, it's actually the, the developed world. And I feel today's narrative in the COP27 has been really emphasizing the, at least the inequities among countries. So I'm curious to know how do you see from a, from a cuisine, from a conflict cuisine perspective uh, on this? Well, I think you're, you're right about the chef's I activism uh, that it is only beginning to start having some impact. Um, but what it does in the developed world, and I think it's a developed world issue, is it raises the awareness of people who are dining out or using food to get a greater sensitivity to the things they can do to prevent more waste. And there's also, as you well know, and many people know here, the greater interest in local production is very, very important in large developed countries. There's uh, a lot of good work going on with the Nordic countries. I know there's a new program in the uh, Baltic areas covering some of the countries, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, which don't even have food waste programs right now that are working with them. So I think these are positive. It's not the answer to the whole world. And I think uh, the message out of Sharm El Sheikh is the, develop, the developing world is angry. They feel that uh, they're not the main polluters and they're not the cause of this, and yet they're gonna pay a price like everybody else. And I think this gets back to an answer of community and local-based solutions. We don't do enough of that. I don't think we enough, uh, invest enough on how local communities can work this way. Um, I know there's some nutrition education that's going on in schools with gardens, but that's not the way it answers. Now, farmers growing, you know, narcotics, uh, that's an ongoing problem. And I think part of that gets to the comment I made about governance. When there's very weak governance, when people don't feel a protection of the state, you have to earn a living. And I've always had my questions about whether the crop substitutions with crops that don't earn livable wages are really effective. And I don't know that we've come up with answers with, to that, but I do think there are enough ways in which you could get communities to rely more on their local food production rather than get them from international markets. But that's going to take a new coalition of governments, private sector, and international organization, which I do think I've been watching because, I mean, I sit in Washington, which is a little bubble, so we all talk to each other, but uh, there is, the war in Ukraine has done something very special to the private sector. They are frightened, they know they need local groups to work, and they also know they need the international community. And I think the key lesson on this is fertilizer. The global fertilizer situation, the rise in price, has been astronomical. Most farmers cannot afford enough fertilizer in sub-Saharan Africa to grow their crops. And I believe there's action taking place at a large scale level of all these different producers to try and mitigate this problem in ways that didn't happen before. We, the jury is still out as to whether this is going to work, but I am actually fascinated by this new embracing of private sector conversations between NGOs in Washington who never before would talk to the private sector and now seems to sit down at the table with them. And uh, so I see this as hope for the future. I wish I could answer everything, but we can have a longer talk on crop substitution someday. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks uh, for this uh, lecture, and uh, thanks to Columbia Global Center Amman. My, question, uh, in the, uh, my questions are, uh, in the 20th century, uh, in 20th century, uh, it was uh, proven that Malthusian uh, theory uh, about food and uh, population growth is wrong and has been overcome by science and modern agriculture. Tec uh, techniques. Uh, so, uh, 
with the misuse of uh, technology and uh, industry that lead to climate change, will uh, science be able to pro processing and uh, fix uh, the new problems uh, facing uh, humans? Uh, and uh, my second question, uh, the, FAO, uh, the FAO organization uh, annoys that uh, there has been a, a decrease uh, in food prices over the six months months uh, prior uh, to September, September, but uh, we did uh, not notice a, a decrease in food uh, prices in the market. So what is the reason? Uh, and thank you. Well, thank you for your question. So I think your first comment about you know the, the fear of the Malthusian revolution was overcome by the Green Revolution and the fact that there was going to be more food produced for the world. Uh, we also now know that a lot of the kind of agriculture that was promoted by the Green Revolution was not sustainable because of the climate impact. I, I think the important thing is going forward, and I could spend hours on this, but I wouldn't want to keep you here overnight, is that um, you, you really have to not look at the past to get to the, to the future because we always look back at what happened. We have to look forward, and there are many, rec first there's recognition about the, the problems of technology of the past and what it did to increase emissions, which people were less conscious of maybe 50 years ago than they are today. And then the other thing is it's not only, I mean, agriculture at large, it's animal agricultural as well, but there are, very hopeful signs, regenerative farming, uh, which has become a new way for many, many farms to operate so that you are not use, wasting the soil or destroying the soil. But it's going to take a long time. I would be the first to say it's going to take effort and education, but this is where you have this combination of private-public partnerships that are beginning to work in communities successfully, and pilot projects are going to be what makes it go forward. Now, you had a second question, and I'm just, could, could you just, I'm trying to, what was your second question? I know you had another great, good point, and I don't want to miss it. Oh, the prices, yes, yes, sorry. I, I was so busy on Malth Malthus that I, um, there's always a lag between uh, commodity prices uh, and the, the market prices. This, this is not unusual at all. Uh, some prices are going down because grain is getting out of the Ukraine uh, and it's getting into markets. Uh, you're also paying for fuel. Price increase is very much an effect of the increased costs of transportation and insurance, mainly fuel and energy. And also, um, you make fertilizer. Uh, some of it requires energy if you're going to use nitrogen-based fuel. So I, that's what's happening. I mean, the prices will go down. The oil prices will go down. Unfortunately, we as consumers right now are very much affected by it. And I think everybody is uh, experiencing this kind of a situation. But it's also a factor of a world war going on and a war that is having a devastating effect on one of the major grain producing regions of the world, plus sanctions that are impacting it because people don't want to ship when there are high insurance costs. I saw some other hands up. There was a gentleman over there. Wow. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Joanna, for a very enriching uh, lecture. What I would like to share with you is four visions for pictures that I have seen, I have experienced, and at the end to tell me about your comments, your opinion uh, about these visions or these uh, pictures. The first one, as a student in the States, I worked in the restaurants of the university, and I saw the quantity of food that was thrown away in these black plastic bags. I was a kid at that time, but still I thought, if all that food was sent away to, to uh, poor countries in Africa, that would have made a difference. And I'm talking here about just one university out of thousands of universities and many other uh, enterprises. The second one, this past week I was in Turkey. And I, 
at night, by 9, 10 o'clock, there, there were these kids collecting these black plastic bags, spreading them by the sidewalk, getting these uh, plastic uh, bags from restaurants, from fast food restaurants, McDonald's, Burger King, and other restaurants. And they were putting away French fries, uh, bread, whatever they can find, and just put it away, hope, I'm sure, for later to be eaten by them or, or their families. The third vision, the third picture. I was in France about, well, um, this thing that I saw about 14, 15 years ago. Uh, driving through the farms, they, there were piles and piles at the time of peach or peaches. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing, the farmers, they were putting uh, diesel on them in order to protect the price, so the price wouldn't go down. That was the farmer's idea, to keep their uh, product, to keep their prices at a certain level and not to go down. And this is only for peaches. I'm sure it's done for many other uh, products. Now something positive. I, I've, seen <laughs> I've seen something on TV here in Jordan. Now we'll move to Jordan. In, um, okay, uh, we have five stars restaurants. Their policy, when the buffet is over, they throw all the food. Some organization, some association intervened, and they started taking portions of food, putting them in, in plastic uh, Tupperwares, and uh, to give them to poor people. And they had, they, uh, I saw this on TV, and they interviewed the kids and the people that were receiving the food. It was a great food, meat and chicken and desserts, something they can never dream of. They, they targeted, targeted certain people to give them uh, that food. So your opinion, your comment on, on what's going on in the world, what can we do? Just your comments, please. Well. I think your observations are very interesting, and I wish we had a lot more time to, to answer them. Uh, I believe there should be laws, and many states in the United States have passed laws which allow restaurants now to give away food. It used to be against the law, which is totally crazy. In the United Kingdom, it was against the law to dumpster dive. Uh, but I think the, the connection of food and climate has uh, certainly elevated the question of food waste to a different level. Is it the solution? No. I would love to see organizations, especially charitable organizations in cities like Amman, work more with restaurants uh, so that food does not get wasted. It always makes me sad to see this happen because there are so many people with great need, but that's a small fraction of the waste that happens. There needs to be a much more organized effort to uh, distribute and prevent this waste from going into landfills, which is where you get the real problems of greenhouse gas emissions. But I appreciate your, your comments. I actually saw what you saw in Turkey also, where there is this effort to feed street children. But it should come from a much better organized way of doing things than just throwing waste into the bag. Uh, there was a very interesting program that was started by the Italian chef Massimo Bottura, called the Refettorio System, which he started in 2016 with the Milan Food Expo. Uh, he was able to get a church refectory um, where he brought in some of the best chefs who were coming to the Milan Expo and took the waste, the food waste from that expo, not food that was garbage, food that wasn't eaten for the day, salads, uh, vegetables, fruits, bread, and he would use them and have other people donate excess foods from the market. And each day a different chef would make food for several hundred people. The refettorio would be open and people like you and me would serve the poor and give them a meal at a nice place, it was a church refectory, and they would get a meal. I then had one that was opened up in Rio de Janeiro with a friend of mine, in, there's one in London, there's one in New York, there's one in Paris. It's not the answer, but it's certainly one more community-driven, chef-driven project that can be very helpful when you have people who need food and you don't want to waste it. So that's just a comment. But there were a few others, and I know we're gonna go for another three minutes, is that right?
W one more question. Okay, well, who's the lucky person? <laughs> Um, thank you, Professor Johanna, for this interesting and illuminating presentation. Well, um, I'm just, uh, I want to remind you of one of the sayings of Thomas Paine, the godfather of American Revolution. The government is always wrong. People are always right. So in light of that, it's interesting that your presentation is somehow depoliticized. By that I mean, you haven't mentioned anything about the deep structure of power dynamics, namely Margaret Thatcher rhetoric. Society does not exist. It's all about the individual responsibility towards you know, all of these issues, including um, food conflict, including the relationship between the government and people. My, my point has to do with this Reaganism combined with um, Margaret Thatcher rhetoric of, that is the deeply seated, you know, narrative of neoliberalism. It's our responsibility as individuals. It's not the responsibility of the government when it comes to all of these big issues. That's one thing. The, the second point of my question has to do with the idea of the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will as once put by Antony Gramsci. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, at the end of the tunnel, the picture is really dark for many of the political reasons that many people would know and familiar with. Look at the list that you just mentioned and talked and addressed, including Iraq, including African countries. Part of the problem has been caused by the United States. I wouldn't put the blame on the United States as a wholesale, you know, just uh, argument, but I guess we, we need more transparency in order to address uh, these issues related to food insecurity. Um, I don't think, that's my view, I don't think it's the responsibility of individuals. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. I, I, I don't consider myself a neoliberal, um, and I think that I don't try to depoliticize the conversation, but rather to present some of the facts. Uh, I mentioned governance. I mean, we could have a whole other lecture on governance, and uh, a lot of the world is going, I think, in the wrong authoritarian direction, but I'm also a strong believer in the role of democracy, not democracy in the United States, but democracy with a small D for people who need to be able to have freedom as food is a human right, and that right has to be respected. It's a public good, and I don't see the food insecurity problem of the world being the fault of any one particular government. I think it's a problem that's much wider and with a much deeper history which we don't have time, unfortunately, to go into. But I respect your opinion, and I would be happy to talk to you during the reception to hear a little bit more about what you have to say. But I want to thank every one of you for your patience and your excellent comments, and uh, I hope maybe someday I'll see you back again. But my address is, I think, up on that screen, and feel free to write me if it's, if it's there. I think that's my conflict cuisine address, but it all goes into the same mailbox. Thank God for technology, right? Thank you.